calling me names. I, you'd think he is my father. Well, well, he goes on sometimes. Well, it's good to be back in the Lord's house tonight. Amen. And uh, how about another amen for Brother Jimmy's message this morning? Amen. 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 I told Jimmy back there we were talking, I said, Brother, I thoroughly enjoyed that. I said, I don't think I've ever heard uh, that preached out of that passage of Scripture. And he said, me neither. <laughs> and, uh, but that's how the Lord is, and that's why often you'll hear me encourage you to read, and, and I think I said this morning to reread, if you will, yes. things that you think you know, because that Bible is, is a depth of knowledge that we'll, we'll never get to the bottom of and, Every time you read it, it can be fresh and it can be new if you allow God to show you and teach you things. And it's a, it, There's no other book, no other book like it in all the world. Amen? You got your Bibles tonight. Go with me to the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter number 19. Luke chapter 19. This is, of course, Palm Sunday. And uh, I guess the most popular part of Palm Sunday, Brother Jimmy touched on it this morning, is Jesus is coming into Jerusalem when the people are praising him, giving him glory, and they put their jackets and their coats on the ground for the donkey to walk on, and, and this same crowd that's just blessing him and, and lifting him up is that same crowd that's going to call for his head in just a few days. But um, nevertheless, it's a beautiful picture of Jesus coming in. But I want you to see another event that takes place this day, one that... Uh, I think we know about it, but when we think of this event, it kind of gets pushed to the back of our mind. But in Luke 19, verses 41, and we'll read 41 through 44 here in just a moment. We see a side of Jesus that we don't see very much of. And every time you see something rare about Jesus' behavior, it's worth noting. It's worth paying attention. If Jesus doesn't do something but once or twice or three times, you better pay attention because there's something there. This is one of the occasions where we see Jesus weeping. Luke chapter 19, verse number 41. If you got it, say amen. amen. The Bible says, And when he was come near, speaking of the city of Jerusalem, he beheld the city, and he wept over it, saying, If thou hadst known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. For the days shall come upon thee that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee and compass thee round and keep thee in on every side and shall lay thee even with the ground and thy children within thee and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another because thou knowest not the time of thy visitation. Father, we humbly stand in your presence now, God. We are so thankful for you to be here again tonight. We pray, God, as we stand before your word, your blessed reading. We pray that you'll bless our hearts to receive it, to hear it, to be obedient to it. May your spirit move among us as it has this morning. And God, we are thankful for your presence. May we be obedient now. Hide me behind Christ that he may be seen and heard. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 You be seated. Thank you for standing with me. I want to preach tonight on the sorrow of the Savior. The sorrow of our Savior. Very few times you see Jesus, as verse 41 says, very few times you see him weeping. And uh, a little thing that might be interesting to you, Jesus came from heaven to earth. Jesus was and is the Son of God. He left everything there to come here for you and me. And think about it, he was born, you know, in, in the manger in Bethlehem. What was the first thing Jesus did when he came into this world? Same thing most every baby does when it comes into this world. It cries, it weeps. And as his life goes on, how do we find Jesus? We find him weeping. You get to Lazarus' tomb, and you see Jesus feeling the broken heart of human beings, feeling what that feels like to hurt, to have a, a, a something in here that just breaks. He felt that, and the Bible says he wept. Well, then you go on, and you see him at the end of his life, and you see him hanging on the cross, and you see at the very end of his life, he cries out again, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Jesus cried coming in while he was here and going out. But I'm glad to report in the book of Revelation that says when God changes things and makes things new, the first thing he does for you and me, no more tears, no more crying, no more sorrow. You know why? Jesus said that's enough of that. 
Jesus said, that's enough of that broken heart. That's enough of the suffering. It's enough of sorrow. I cried my whole way through my journey on earth, and those people are crying and suffering their whole way through this journey. So thank God one day that will all be gone. No more tears shed. I want that to be a wonderful day. But that day has not yet come. There are still tears that need to be shed. Can we agree with that? Now, very often in Christianity today, we preach that uh, Christianity is a happy religion. If we get with Christ, then He'll heal the brokenness in our hearts. He'll take away the sorrow. He'll make us have joy. And He will. But we cannot lose the brokenness that our Savior carried. I want you to see in verse 41. Here He is in the middle of the, as Jimmy said this morning, the greatest acknowledgement of who He was and is that ever took place on the earth. This is something where you would think Jesus in his heart is saying, Finally, finally after three years they're acknowledging who I am. Finally after all I've done, they understand. And I think Jesus did quite enjoy finally getting the praise he deserved. Not in an egotistical way, but uh, I believe he did enjoy that. However, verse 41, and you can cross-reference this with other scriptures, but it says as he was coming from the Mount of Olives. Now the Mount of Olives stood above the city of Jerusalem, still does. And uh, as you descend the Mount of Olives, you come down into the Kidron Valley. And as you come up from the Kidron Valley, you approach through the eastern gate of that city. And here we see Jesus coming out of the valley, if you will, of the shadow of death, and coming to that eastern gate, which is where the Messiah is to come again later one day. We ain't got time for all that. But as he comes in, he's being recognized right as Messiah but something comes over him now in Luke when it talks about him weeping over Lazarus it gives us the idea in the word the language that he is shedding tears he's crying he comes and he sees Lazarus he sees the mourning he sees the brokenness he experiences that pain and he weeps he cries the word used here in verse 41 is a different word it's a spontaneous bursting into tears, a bursting into a cry, almost as if he just immediately felt broken. And it's a very extreme reaction. Jesus is going into the city and he looks over it and he realizes some things. And we're going to talk about those in just a minute. But as he realizes what they have missed out on, it completely breaks the heart of Christ. And he's not just crying as one who's lost a friend. He's crying for those who have turned away their last opportunity. And now let me tie this in today, church. We need to be still weeping as our Savior did over these who are turning away from our Savior. The, the day is coming when every person will have his last day. Do we believe that? There's coming a day when everybody will have their last day on earth. And the only thing that's going to matter when we die is what we chose to do with Christ. What did we do with Jesus? If we accepted Him, we have a promise, we have joy, and we have so much waiting. But if we have rejected him, we know that the Bible teaches there is hell waiting for us. Jesus looks at a city. He looks at a people. And his heart destroys within itself. And he busts into tears and he says, oh, Jerusalem. Oh, no. My heart is breaking for you. And I want you to see this. In the time of joy, Jesus found tears for what was going on. At verse 41, it says, And when he was come near, he beheld the city and he wept over it. Do you think God is upset over America? Do you think God is upset when he looks at his holy city where he established the worship, where the first and the second temple were, where his people were, Canaan, if you will, a city that he put back in the 40s, he gave them back their independence? Do you think he looks at things like that? Do you think he looks at the situations in Africa, in Europe, in places you and I have never been? He looks at that, and I think the heart of God still breaks today. Christian, may I ask you this? Does your heart still break that there are lost people in this world? This Easter week, I hope, and don't take me wrong here, but I hope your heart breaks over one lost soul this week. I hope your heart breaks, and don't take me wrong there. I want you to pray God does me that same way because here's what I know. If our heart breaks, we'll do something. If our heart breaks, it'll stir us. If our heart breaks, it'll drive us to prayer. It'll drive us to our knees. It'll drive us to a place where we say, Oh, God, don't let so-and-so die and go to hell. God, don't let so-and-so die in that situation. Oh, God, don't let that happen. I, say, I believe that's Jesus' heart as he looks over the city. Now, I want you to look at this, verse 42. I want you to think with me as we try to think as our Savior may have thought. But I believe here as he speaks, 
we see that he is weeping over a loss of peace. Verse 42 saying, If thou hadst known, even thou at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. What is this world looking for? It's looking for peace. What is the church promised this world? It's promised it peace. What is it that all the kids, I believe very naively, were marching for this weekend? Peace, peace, peace. We all want peace. We all want an end of trouble. We all want an end of sorrow. We all want things to stop. Let me tell you something, friend. It'll never stop until we turn to Christ. It'll never stop until He is God and King and Lord and this Bible rules supreme. It will never stop. But man's search for peace will go on and on and on. The people in Jerusalem were looking for peace. You know what they were looking for? They were looking for what Judas looked for. They were looking for a man to ride in on a horse with a large sword, with a saber, with a helmet of iron, standing head and shoulders above everyone else. They were looking for a warrior to ride into Jerusalem to take on Caesar and Rome and everybody else and slay them and set them free. That was peace for them. Peace for us is not much different. You see, we're not looking for the peace Jesus gives. We're looking for the peace Judas was wanting. Let that sink in. Judas was looking for physical peace. Deliver us. Save us. The Pharisees, the Jews of that day, they weren't looking for internal peace. They were looking for external peace. I want things out here fixed, and then I'll be happy. I don't care what gets fixed out here. It'll never make you happy. I don't care what gets fixed. People say, well, if I had a million dollars, my life would be better. You want to bet? <laughs> oh, you might pay a bill or two. But I'll tell you what, it's not going to change. Money runs out eventually. Money's nothing but cut down trees with ink on them. It's all it is. My friend, that on the outside is momentary. It's, it's temporary. Jesus looked at the city and said, that's all you want is external peace. You're only worried about your flesh. You're only worried about what's going to be good for you. And you totally miss the peace I have brought to you. The peace in here. And Jesus said, if now it's hid, you can't even see it. They've turned. They turned the wise, just as they did to Moses. Moses, we don't want to see that glory shining on you. Moses, cover it up. And a veil was put over his face. Jesus came and he said, oh, you don't understand. Peace is rode into town. Peace itself. Peace is not a thing, I've told you before. Peace is a person. Peace is Jesus. If you want peace, get Jesus. You'll get all you can handle. Without him, there is no peace. So if you don't have it, get more Jesus. <laughs> Amen? Simple as I can make it for you. The closer you get to him, the more peaceful it is. Ask the boys in the boat, who is this? That even the wind and the seas obey his voice. My friend, more than that obey his voice. The demons in hell obey his voice. Amen. Satan himself obeys his voice. The earth itself obeys his voice. One day the Bible says the sun won't shine no more. Guess who flips the switch? Jesus. He'll look at that mighty, majestical sun that burns with power we can't understand and he'll put it out with his voice. That's Jesus. That's the peace that I need, that you need, the peace that he tried to bring to that holy city. And he rode in and the tears had just spontaneously busted. This wasn't a slow cry that begins with a, a sniffle and the tears begin to roll down. He busted forth with tears and crying. Emotional. I said, oh, no. You've not seen. You've hid your eyes. And now peace is hid from you. My friend, is peace hid from you? Have you lost your peace? Can I tell you that Jesus stands, as Jimmy told you this morning, with his arms outstretched to give you peace. Now don't get the wrong idea about peace. Peace is not a solution to all your problems. Peace, as I told you, is a person. Peace is a person. It's Christ. And I'll tell you this, the closer we get to Christ, the smaller the things of this earth will look. Do they get better? Sometimes they do. Sometimes they won't. But I'll tell you this, I'd rather have a bad life in the arms of Christ than have a bad life without Him. If I'm going to got to go through it, I want Him as close to me as I can. I want to know He's there. That when it gets rough, He picks me up and holds me and helps me. But they are hid from thine eyes. Oh, a loss of peace. But if you look in verse 43, a loss of power. Loss of power. For the day shall come upon thee that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee and can pass thee round and keep thee in on every side. Now Jesus here is thinking of the fall of Jerusalem. Titus and his army. Soon, not far from the time Jesus rides in, 
The city is conquered. It's destroyed. The things of the temple are all robbed and they're all pillaged. And the greatest city in the world is left in shambles. And you remember there's another place in the gospel where Jesus says, I tell you, one stone's not going to be left upon another. And they tried to kill him for that. Oh, not our temple. You blasphemer. Jesus again says, and I think I, this is a prayerful conversation. I don't think this is directed to anyone. I think it's prayerful between him and God and for us to learn from. He says, not one stone's going to be left. And I'll tell you what happened. After Jerusalem was pillaged, they began to take the stones one by one from the temple. They would take them one by one. They would come in and take them for this purpose, for that purpose. And eventually they took every single stone that was used to build that temple. You know how I know? Because it ain't there. <laughs> Today, it does not stand there. You go to Israel, you'll see al Oscar Mox, you'll see the Dome of the Rock on that temple mount. There is nothing left of the temple. Jesus was right. That great city thought they had it, didn't they? That great city thought, what are you talking about, Jesus? This is Jerusalem. We are Abraham's children. We are God's. He led us out of Egypt with plagues and miracles. Who do you think you are telling us that we're going to fall to our enemies? America, the greatest nation in the world. Now, don't get me wrong here. I'm not anti-American. I love America. I love America. God bless America. And I hope God keeps blessing America. But I'll tell you what, my friends. We are consumed with the thoughts of our own power. We're consumed with the thought that we can take care of this world. We're consumed with the thought that we know what's best. That we have the answers. We know nothing. And our forefathers knew that. You go back and read the history of our forefathers. Some of them weren't only up and up. I'll give you that. But some of them were praying men who stayed on their knees before God and asking God, Lord, if you don't do this, it won't be. God, if you're not in charge of this, it won't be. They knew what it would take to make this country what it was. And God did. And I'll tell you what, we are so enamored with what we can do, we've lost track of what God's going to do. God looked at Jerusalem and says, you won't turn to me, then I'll turn you over. Friends, listen to me, I'm scared to death for this world. I'm scared to death for the United States. Because if we do not come to Christ, God is going to hand us over. What's he going to hand us over to, preacher? Sin. You can fill in that blank however you want to imagine it, but it will be sin. It will not be the things of God. Will it be the Muslims? We don't know. Will it be something else? We're not sure. But I'm telling you, folks, we are headed in the wrong direction because we're headed away from the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus stood there and says, You don't understand. You're fixing to be overthrown. You think you've got it together, Jerusalem. You think you've got it figured out. You think you've got this taken care of. But you're fixing to fall. And you wouldn't listen to me. And you're going to die without hope. Loss of power. Not only that, verse 44, a loss of presence. Jesus said, speaking of this same event, and shall lay thee even with the ground. In case you're wondering, that means dead. If you're even with the ground, that means you're lying on the ground. In this context, it is that idea of war. And thy children within thee. And they shall not leave thee in thee one stone upon another. Because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. A loss of presence. Jesus said you didn't recognize I was here. Now it's all fixing to fall apart. You need to hear this. Jesus says, because you did not recognize me, you will die. And your children will die. Is that a curse? No, it's not. It's a natural order of things. You know how I know this? Because I work in a job where I get to see what kids turn out from a mom and daddy who don't love God, who hate God, who do not acknowledge Christ, or who hate Christ, hate the church. Can I tell you what kind of kids come from homes like that? Kids that hate Christ. Kids that hate God. They don't know why. They just know that's what they know. That's a sad thing. It's a pitiful thing. Can you use it any wonder? Jesus wept. He said, you not even recognize who it is that's come to you. And now because you've rejected me, you're going to die. My friend, this world is not going to die because it's bad. This world is going to die because it's rejected Christ. Judgment is coming. We must be as our Savior and find the tears once again. Now, I know what it's like to become numb. It's easy. 
you turn on the news if you watch the news every day. I don't know how you do it, first of all. But if you do happen to be able to watch the news every day, you'll find something happening to you. You'll find yourself coming numb to things. You'll hear of awful things and you're just going about your day. And the job I work in, it is a very real problem that I struggle with a lot. Some of them call it compassion fatigue. But it's not just for me, it's for all of us. It's when we literally are not shocked anymore. We're not surprised anymore. We hear of what's going on and we're like, yeah. And we just don't care. And I'll tell you why it's a problem. It's because if we don't care enough about it when we're not praying, we're sure not going to think about it when we are praying. My friend, we at the church of the Lord Jesus Christ need a broken heart. We need a heart that is willing to be soft and be broken for the sin, for the lost. Jesus came into this city in an event that is the only time he was lifted up and worshipped in this manner. And he breaks. I wonder if any of them said, Jesus, what's wrong? Can you imagine them walking along the donkey into town and all of a sudden, as they've already come through, Jesus just busts into tears. Spontaneous crying. Can't you hear John look up and say, Master, what's wrong? Did somebody hurt you? Peter says, Tell me who did it, Jesus. I'll fix it. Maybe Matthew said, Jesus, what happened? Maybe some of the others just looked at him wondering. They didn't understand what was going on in the heart of Christ. But we can. We can look and now see that Jesus was looking at a situation that could have been much different. He was looking at a city that could have been much different. He was looking at people who didn't have to die. They were going to die and his heart broke. Church, this Easter week, let's get a broken heart for somebody. Let's get a broken heart for this world, this lostness. Let's get a broken heart for the people in our families, our friends that do not know Christ. Make a phone call. In this world we live in, send them a text message or a Facebook message or get somehow, somehow invite them to church. You can do it face to face, do that. That's lost anymore. We don't do a whole lot of that. Any way you can get a hold of them, invite them to church. Tell them you care. And we'll pray that God will do what God will do. Jesus came in a week before his death. And his heart was broken. Not for what he was getting ready to go through, but for those who already made their decision. Have you made your decision? Can I tell you, when Jesus cried out on the cross, he was crying for you. Do you know that? When he was hanging between heaven and hell with nails in his hands, with holes in him, with flesh torn, I don't mean to be graphic, but it's the truth of the matter. When he was hanging between heaven and hell, not looking like a human being, beard ripped from his face, a crown of thorns in his head so far it had to be cut out. I'm talking about not looking human anymore. He hung there and he cried. He wasn't crying because he was suffering. He was crying because of the pain of sin that he felt. The sword's not what killed him. Oh, the argument in the world today is did the Jews kill him? Did the Romans kill him? I'll tell you who killed him. Jesus killed him. He said, no man takes my life. I'm laying it down. You see, the scientists tell us that what supposedly happened to Jesus as Josephus tells us it did he could never have survived many crucifixion victims died before they ever got to the cross because of the injuries sustained during beatings most of them never made it and the ones that did made it died almost immediately after they were hung there Jesus went through a beating historians tell us like nobody else ever did he was a mess I'm not talking about a <laughs> Hollywood did a pretty good job with it but I tell you he was worse it was something to behold he didn't die. They nailed him through in pressure, nervous points with most of the blood flowed out of his body. He still didn't die. They hung him up with all of what body weight he had left going against those nerve endings and those joints and everything in him. The knees being bent up to suffocate him as he laid over his own knees. That was made to suffocate them. And the only way to get a breath was to push up to get some air in. There was nothing to push against but the nails between his feet. Think of it. But that wasn't why he was crying. He said, Father, why have you forsaken me? He didn't say that because the nails hurt, friend. He didn't say that because the crown hurt. It hurt. He felt every, every bit of it. He cried out to God because he became sin. 
And for the first time ever, there was complete separation between Christ and the Father. And he did not like it. He cried out and says, God, where are you at? God, what happened? Why have you forsaken me? Where did you go? I believe it's Hebrews tells us he turned his back on his own side. He could not, the Bible says he will not look upon sin. Have you made your decision about him? He's made his decision about you. And you know what his decision was? Not my will. Thy will be done. He embraced the cross. He drug it through the streets. He didn't fight. He didn't argue. He didn't put up a fight at all. He laid there and let them do that. So much so that when Malchus thrust the spear, or Longinus rather, thrust, thrust the spear into the side and the blood and the water came out, he said, surely this was the Son of God. They knew this wasn't real. This wasn't right. This wasn't what it's supposed to be. He didn't do that for him. He did it for you. What a Savior. And he wept. My friend, I'll tell you, I want to have a broken heart like my Jesus did. Now, Christianity is supposed to be happy, and most of the time it is, but I'll tell you, when it comes to sin, it's a reality. And if it broke my Savior's heart, it needs to break my heart. Jesus had happy times. Jesus had joy, rejoicing and happy times, and you will too. But until he comes... Let's not lose the burden for the lost. Let's not lose the thing in here that says, Oh God, touch them. Oh God, don't let them die like that. Oh God, let me get through to them. God, let somebody get through to them. Oh God, don't let them perish. That is the heart of God. He is not willing that any should perish. That all would come to Christ. Have you come to Christ tonight? Can you say confidently that you belong to Christ and he belongs to you? My friend, he died for you. Did you know that? He gave it all. He suffered like nobody ever has for you. Have you accepted him? Have you accepted that? Or are you still wondering about it? Or have you just in your mind been saying no for a long time? Let me tell you something, friend. It's time for you to give in. Somebody said in Sunday school this morning, that's a fight you can't win when you fight against God. <laughs> and you ain't going to win that. Come to Jesus. He died for you, friend. Let's carry a burden. And Jesus rode into town that last time with them worshiping all around. But he said, oh, if they just believe, they would have peace, they would have power, and they would have my presence. Do not leave this church without the peace that only comes in knowing Christ, the power that is only found in knowing Christ, and the presence of him as close as he's ever been. Don't leave that way. Because if you do, you missed it. Don't miss Jesus. Let's stand together all around the church tonight. As we stand, if we're able to stand, let's stand.